Hey, greetings to one and to all. Once again, I want to welcome you to another study in God's words. Okay, so we've reached our final part in the series of our replies to Naphtali 1981. Um, is under the charges of Ellen White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, Bible contradictions, um, Freemasons, and even Ellen White as a prophet herself. Now, um, I obviously recommend that you go back and watch parts one to parts four because it's going to make a lot more sense as we cover this final topic. Um, we did cover the things regarding con um, Bible contradictions. We saw um, this thing about the clear word Bible, whether it's a Seventh-day Adventist Bible or, you, you know, how it all came about. Um, we also covered a very interesting topic, which was um, Michael the Archangel, whether it's Jesus or whether it's not. And if it's Jesus, how does the Bible prove this? Uh, we also covered just in our recent part, which was part four. We covered um, Ellen White and William Miller in light of Freemasons and that I believe was quite an interesting one because we covered the charge to see if they were actually Freemasons or not. Now we validated everything using just the Bible because this is obviously the standard um, that every Christian ought to live by. Um, it's a Christian way of life and based upon what we saw in the previous parts, Ellen White endorsed the Bible to a very high degree. Right, now before we start part 4, we came to the conclusion that Ellen White was not a Freemason, but William Miller was a Freemason, but he obviously resigned his membership in the year 1831, which means that the early Adventists and the Seventh-day Adventists have no ties with secret societies, which includes Freemasons. But the interesting fact is this, Nathalie puts up a picture which may seem to contradict everything that was said regarding Ellen White, William Miller, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, etc. and their non-affiliation with the Freemasons and secret societies. Now notice this picture, um, this is the picture that he claims was made by Ellen and James White. And now I want you to notice this picture. This picture is um, an obelisk on the tombstone of Ellen White and also James White. Now, the majority of us probably know that this is a blatant symbol of the Illuminati and Freemasons. Um, you can see the all-seeing eye in this picture right here. And then you can see the obelisk which came from Egypt on the gravestone of Ellen and James White. So, I guess the main question is this. If she is not a Freemason, neither if James White is a Freemason, what on earth is this doing on her tombstone? Why is, why is this obelisk on her grave? And obviously, why is there an eye in the middle of this picture, which we probably all know as the Eye of Lucifer? Now, I have to be honest about everything that I study and everything that I go on based upon these things. When I saw this picture, I was, I was quite troubled because, and I want to be truthful about this, I've covered things in the past regarding Freemasons, um, the Eye of Lucifer, and so on. Uh, I do remember doing a documentary called The Doctrines of Entertainment, where we covered quite a lot of these symbolisms and... And we also linked it to the symbol of Lucifer. So basically, I'm not a stranger to these things. So with that said, I really had to take time to really sit down, pray about it, because it's because of the fact that I was conditioned to believe that the all-seeing eye represented Lucifer as well as everybody else. But at the same time, I know through my study of the Word of God, um, examining the prophecies and the clarity of God's Word, God led me to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Not part of a denomination, but part of a movement. Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church isn't necessarily... I mean, if you look in, if you look in the histories, it's not a, a denomination. It's actually a movement. Um, it's a movement based upon what the disciples started all the way up to um, the Reformers, up to the Millerites, up to the early Adventists, and up to this point in time. So though the Lord brought me to the Seventh-day Adventist movement, after seeing these things and taking time to really pray about it, I really had to allow the Lord to just tell me what what, what is going on with this? What is the matter with this thing? Why is, it, why is it even there? And friends, as I was studying and praying and researching these things out, it's like the Lord brought clarity upon clarity upon clarity. Not based upon the background information alone, but based upon the subject matter itself. Now what do I mean? Well in Isaiah chapter 14 it lets us know that Satan wanted to, to emulate God. Now this was one of the thoughts that led to his downfall and that agenda hasn't really you know, changed since he's been kicked out of heaven. Um, if you remember in the Garden of Eden he wanted to pursue this same agenda on Adam and Eve by saying you will be as gods knowing good and knowing evil. 
So as the Lord brought this verse to my mind, I wondered what this has to do with the symbol of Lucifer or the adopted symbol of Lucifer, that being the all-seeing eye. And it's almost as if the Lord put this thought and question in my mind, which is simply this. If you break down the words all-seeing eye, what does it imply? It implies that you can see all. Now, can Satan see everything? Like, is he... Can you, can you see everything at once, you could say? Job chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 came to mind. It says this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Or in modern language, where, where, where did you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. So according to this verse, Satan was on earth traveling from one place to the other, but now he's in the presence of God. And it could be explained that he didn't even see Job because God said, well, have you even considered my servant Job? So therefore, no, Satan can't see all. But this verse also expresses who can see all. While God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Where was God when he said this? He was in heaven, but yet he could see Job. Therefore, the only one that sees all is God. And when this revelation came to mind, it was almost like one of those, you know, those light bulb moments. Because when I said that the agenda of Satan was to be like God, um, and, and the title of the all-seeing eye implies that the all-seeing eye sees all, which only belongs to God, it's obvious that this symbol of the all-seeing eye actually should belong to God rather than belonging to Satan. I hope that makes sense. So you can say that Satan has taken something that belongs to God and the world has accepted it as the symbol of Lucifer. And therefore it's not surprising that as of recent this symbol has been displayed by hundreds and thousands of people in the entertainment industry throwing up this symbol paying homage to Lucifer. And therefore this tells me that Satan's agenda is still trying to be fulfilled in this area. But at the same time if you notice Ellen White's writings it's almost as if she takes away this title from Lucifer and puts it back on God. Notice some examples. This is from Testimonies Volume 5 page 334. It says, Go to him with your soul all stained as it is. So it's talking about the it's talking about all of us coming in the condition as we are. So it's like we can't come to God in a righteous condition, but come to him as you are, sinful, needy, stained up in this case. So it says, Go to him with your soul all stained as it is. Like the psalmist, throw its chambers open to the all-seeing eye, exclaiming, Search me, O God, and know my heart. David says, Know my thoughts and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Another example from the Youth Instructor, July 21, 1892, it says, The all-seeing eye of Lucifer? No, the all-seeing eye of God is upon us. The secret thoughts of our hearts are not hidden. Every one of us will be judged according to the deeds done in the body. I inquire of you today, how do you stand before God? How does he who can understand every motive, see every thought, hear every word, behold every action of your life, regard your case? I'm just gonna I'm leave the rest out, but I'm just gonna I'm just basically highlighting the point that Ellen White is taking away this title that belongs to God and putting it back on God when whereas the world is saying that this symbol belongs to Lucifer. Now I'm gonna use some biblical examples. Um, if you notice in the book of Ezekiel, um, Ezekiel is in vision, and what he sees is the visions of God with the appearance of God Himself. Um, I want you to consider these verses. Ezekiel chapter one verse one says this. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Sheba, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now just to summarize the, um, the visions, um, he is in vision at the moment, but he also notices four living creatures, and then he sees these four rings round about them. Um, these rings are kind of intertwined, it's like a rings within the rings. But I, note, I want you to notice what he sees on these rings. Verse 18 says, And for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. And their rings were full of 
eyes round about them four. Now, I want you to notice in another example, John, um, the revelator in the book of Revelation. Now, he's also in vision and he sees the exact same thing that Ezekiel sees too. Now, I want you to notice what he says and I want you to also notice where the symbol of the eye is upon. Notice where it is. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, now, first of all, who is a lamb that's been slain? Jesus Christ. And notice, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the world, or rather all the earth. So friends, as we just stop, take a step back and question what we have always learned things will start to open up, things that we may have taken for granted because we're so used to knowing these things. This symbol of the eye actually belongs to God. Now I wanted to see if there was any more verses and one of my friends, Marcus, he actually showed me some verses which actually justified what the Lord was revealing. Um, here's some examples, some extra ones. Psalm chapter 33 verse 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Um, Ezra chapter 5 verse 5 says, But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. And then you also have Psalms chapter 11 verse 4 which says, The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Now this verse in particular, Psalm chapter 11 verse 4, um, I'm going to bring this back up as we go along as we explain this chart. But friends, I hope this is clear so far, seeing that Satan's agenda is to be like God, which is why he has taken this symbol of the eye and placed it upon himself. And I believe that even though many people expose the symbol to show that Satan is evil or to show that this is part of Satan, I somehow think that he actually wanted it this way because it will it will further publicize the symbol showing that he is God. Now the biblical purpose for the eye represented the spirit of God which has gone out into all the world. Now based on further study we know that the spirit of God is everywhere in this world which means that he is all knowing and all seeing. So through false religions, um, the teachings of the Eye of Horus, uh, people conditioned to believe that this symbol belongs to Lucifer, this also represents the fact that Satan wants to fulfill his agenda in any way that he can. Now friends, it's not only the all-seeing eye that Satan tries to, to counterfeit, but it's also God's law. We know that God's law is the Ten Commandments, and Satan brings his own counterfeit law, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Um, the summarization of godliness is manifested in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Satan brings his counterfeit, and he implements his his evilness or his evil godliness you could say and he brings in what's known as the dragon the beast and the false prophet this is in the book of revelation and um, we also see in the book of malachi that the son pointed to jesus as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings but then satan promotes this by having this symbol over the eye and also people worshiping the sun itself um, God implemented his day, which is the seventh day Sabbath, and Satan brings up a counterfeit day, which is Sunday. I mean, there's quite a few more. I mean, God established his covenant with Nawa with the symbol of the rainbow. But then Satan uses the same symbol to promote the same sex agenda and unity. So, I mean, as we're seeing this all-seeing eye symbol given to Satan, it's no different than what we've just gone through in this list that I just mentioned. We can therefore see, because the, because the definition of the all-seeing eye is that you can see all, and you're all-knowing, the only one that can, that can be qualified to have this title is God himself. Now friends, I'm obviously not going to be, you know, wearing an all-seeing eye on my shirt or putting it on my YouTube page or, you know, just, I, I already know the mindsets of people. But what I'm doing is I'm just setting the record here as we go through the evidence because this picture obviously has been, you know, like it's been put on display to say that this is a Freemason, a Freemasonry group. But even in Christianity itself, there's been a symbol that's been adopted, which actually was a, a, a method of torture and death from the pagan Romans. And that symbol is obviously the cross. 
Now, that wasn't a Christian symbol at first, but it's been adopted as a Christian symbol. Uh, I've noticed people put it as jewellery, they have it tattooed on them, and all because it's a famous symbol. But obviously we don't worship the cross as Christians, but we worship the one who died for the salvation of man on the cross. Hence why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Anyway, um, I don't want to prolong the foundation. I'm sure it's been set. So we're going to go into the evidence. But please bear in mind all the examples that has been given at this time. Because it's going to make sense as we go along. Now firstly, I wanted to check out the claim that Ellen White and James White made this image. Because based upon study 4, um, our study showed that she, she completely called people to ignore to reject and not even to be associated with freemasons and secret societies um she used a very popular biblical verse which was not to be equally yoked with unbelievers we have to be unequally yoked so i did a bit of research just to just to get some information about this so i went directly to the source um, I went on the Ellen White website and I looked up some archived information about the Way of Life picture as it's been titled the Way of Life picture. And after searching it out, I found some information which didn't add up to the claims that Nathalie made. Now, notice the background history of this picture, um, why it was made, um, the date expressed, and compare it to the professed validated information from Nathalie. Okay, so I'm going to read it. It says... Dr. M. G. Kellogg designed and copyrighted the original picture entitled The Way of Life from Paradise Lost to Paradise Restored. It was first advertised in the Review and Herald, May 27, 1873. That same year, Kellogg published a 15-page key of explanation to accompany the allegorical picture. The picture was an immediate success and it, pr and it proved to be a great aid to the Adventist evangelists in their efforts to properly present the relationship between the law and the gospel. Alright, notice this, it says, By 1876, James White had decided to improve the picture and to produce a new descriptive brochure. He wrote to his wife on April 7, 1876, which says this, I go to New York in May to get out Way of Life and Charts. Tell Willie that I begin my book on Way of Life next week and will let him have it for signs piece by piece. Now it says in July of the same year, Ellen White wrote from New Jersey. The Way of Life is to be revised and improved in every way. The charts are to be considered and our pictures for books are to be engraved in New York. There is enough to consider and plan and arrange and we hope to do this all with exactitude which will leave us no chance for regret. The designs of Way of Life are now to be presented to the artists, also Law of God charts. This is a large business being carried on by Father just now in Philadelphia, letter 35, 1876. Further inspired with the power of the picture, James White next planned to publish a book to accompany it, in t enlarging the key of explanation already in print. He would title it, Christ the Way of Life, From Paradise Lost to Paradise Restored. But this ambition was not fulfilled in his lifetime. He died on August 6, 1881. With the help of her sons, Ellen White undertook to fulfill her husband's plan and in the year 1883, a beautiful new plate engraving was copyrighted by Ellen White which placed Christ at the center of the plan of salvation. So now comparing the information that we've just read, this is an official letter and also based upon what Natalia said, um, I had to put out some aims and objectives. Now the first objective was to find out if it was actually Kellogg or if it was James and Ellen White who actually created this image, um, if it was done in 1873 as it was mentioned in the letter or 1874 as Natalie claims and I also need to find out the, the, um, the 15 page key of explanation because it will explain the content in this picture. Um, the second aim and objective is to find the revised chart in 1876 and to see if it was actually done by James White because obviously the first aim and objective is, is based upon the fact that 
Ellen White and James White actually did the first one in 1873. And then we have the third aim and objective which is to find the revised chart made by Ellen White in the year 1883. Okay, now let's take a look at the picture. Um, obviously, the first arrow we can see is pointing to the all-seeing eye, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. But he's also pointing um, an arrow showing the New Jerusalem in the form of a pyramid. Now, friends, I don't want to judge the motive, but sometimes, like to be honest, I'm, I'm really forced to think that when thorough information isn't researched properly, it's, it's almost as if one is trying to find something that isn't there. I believe this is really this is really poor because what I'm seeing here is the New Jerusalem isn't where he's pointing it's actually in the top right hand corner and secondly I was actually able to find the official picture the high quality picture from the Library of Congress where it was copyrighted and archived as well and funny enough it doesn't mention Ellen White or James White who made this picture neither was it made in the year 1874 in fact, it was made by Kellogg and made in 1873. Now, notice carefully this picture. Um, I know we can't see it clearly, but if you notice, you can see two initials and then the rest of the name. Now, obviously, those two initials could be E, G, and then White. Or, well, it can't be J, White, because it's two initials. Okay, so let's just have a look at it in the high-quality picture. Um, this can be downloaded in the Library of Congress if you... Want the picture yourself, um, I will send it to you. Um, the, the picture is roughly 120 some odd megabytes. It's quite, it's quite a big picture because you can zoom in very, very closely and you will show the exact detail. Okay, so this is the high quality version. Like I said, let's look at the initials. As we can see, friends, it says designed by M.G. Kellogg. So right there, we can see it wasn't E.G. White or James White, but it was M.G. Kellogg. So as you've seen this in the high quality image, though you can't see this in Natalie's image, you can clearly tell that it is from Kellogg, as you've just seen the high quality picture. So the claim that this is done through Ellen or James White is completely false. It's false information. Okay, now if you also notice the date on the image, notice what it says. I'm just going to read the statement. It says this. Entered according to the Act of Congress in the year... 1873 by M.G. Kellogg in the office of the Librarian of Congress in Washington DC. Address Review and Herald, Battle Creek, Michigan. So friends, James White and Ellen White didn't make this image, neither was it dated in 1874 but 1873. Okay, so that part is already clear. I don't want to prolong that one, we're going to continue, but um... I did say we're going to check out that pyramid as the New Jerusalem. Alright, so here it is. Now, friends, that looks like a mountain. And this looks like the New Jerusalem. So obviously, this pyramid is not the New Jerusalem. It's just a mountain. Okay, so um, back to our aim and objectives. We found out that Kellogg was the one who made it. And we also see that it was actually done or made rather in the year 1873 but now what needs to be sought after is the key of explanation that 15 page key of explanation because this will explain the eye in the tree and the reason why I really needed to find this is because like I said before you have to let the person who is under fire explain their position you can't just run off with your own theory and think oh this is the case so we need to find out this information first before we continue now friends, I search up, down, left, right and centre. Um, I have actually messaged the Ellen White estate. Um, I haven't got a reply yet, so I did a bit more searching on the internet and I couldn't find the 15 page key of explanation. But thank God I did find the section I was looking for in the Review and Herald and guess what year it was? 1873. Now, personally, I would like to still get that 15 page key of explanation. Um, I will try and search for it, but I guess Maybe based upon, you know, the excerpt that was put in the Review and Herald. I don't really need to find it anymore. But I want you to know what Kellogg added in his explanation in the article of the image and also what he mentions about the eye and what it represented. It says, The above is the title of the allegorical picture designed to illustrate the fall of man into sin and his redemption therefrom. 
It presents to the eye at a single glance the object of the forms and ceremonies of the patriarchal Jewish and Christian systems of religion and illustrates the fact that the law of God and the gospel of Christ run parallel from the fall of man to the end of probation. It also shows a contrast between the ritual law of the Jews and the moral law are expressed in the Ten Commandments, illustrating the manner in which the former ended at the death of Christ, while the latter remains its eternal and unchangeable as the throne of heaven, being the basis of God's government over all intelligent beings. Now from this he goes on to explain the detail of each picture in the scene, but obviously we want to go directly to this eye, the all-seeing eye. What did it mean? Notice what he says. The all-seeing eye of God is represented as looking through his law to behold the children of men and compare their actions with the requirements of his law and thus detect every sin. There you have it. From the very person who made the image, he gives the explanation to state that the all-seeing eye of God, notice he says, of God, was based upon the fact of looking through his law to detect what sin was. Now if you notice the same wordings, it was based upon what we said in Psalms chapter 11 verse 4. I just say I'll bring this verse back up again. It says, The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven, his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. So Naphtali's claim that this is the all-seeing eye of Ra, again, is false. So friends, the first aim and objective is completed. The image that Nafti displayed with his research added, unfortunately, was completely erroneous. Now friends, listen, I completely understand because again, this is a symbol that has been adopted by the pagans. But what you have to understand is that in their time, this wasn't just an image that you could just display on the internet for anybody to add their own interpretation on what it meant. Alright, they didn't even have internet during that time. But remember, the context of this image was to explain the biblical visual view about the fall of man to, um, to, you know, to the end of probation. So, so when they did their presentations in tents, in churches and so on, they, they took the image with them and explained it as they went along for the purpose of opening the understanding of the people. Now for me personally, would I would I use an image like that today? No, I probably wouldn't use something like that. Um, I'd probably use something else. But I mean, based upon the times that they were in at that time, I might have used it. I don't know. But... I wouldn't I would never be able to know because I can't you know go back in history so I understand but again you have to consider all angles now if someone said you look very gay today for example in those times it would mean you look very happy obviously today that's not going to mean happy is it you already know what it means so Kellogg has explained himself um, therefore you can't assume that he's a mason because he's associated with Ellen and James White and also the Great Advent Movement. And if he obviously was associated with Ellen White, remember what we saw in the previous part? Ellen White would have rebuked him the same way that he rebuked Falkhead, seeing that the council was for him not to join himself to Freemasons. And we see no mention of this because Kellogg was not a Mason, nor does this picture promote Freemasonry things. Remember friend, we have to consider all the angles. Okay, now the second aim and objective is that we need to find out then if another image was made by James White in the year 1876. And the third aim and objective is to find out if Ellen White made the other image which was in 1883. Now I'm not going to prolong this one because it was very easy to find. Um, I believe the main one was to find the objective, the aim and objective of number one which was already established. So um, with regards to the aim and objective in um, the second and third aim and objective, yes, James White did make a revised from Kellogg's one in the year 1876. Um, this is the picture right here. Uh, you can see a very slight difference, not a much difference, but I mean it's the very slightest of difference. And this documentation here shows the copyright and the explanation of his picture. And then we have Ellen White's revised version of James White's um, image um, displayed here. And then we have the documentation which displays that Ellen White copyrighted this picture in the year 1883. And I must say that the beauty about this image is based upon what she says 
and that is that it portrays Jesus Christ in the center, whereas the other pictures, Christ was there, but it wasn't as, you know, like, broadcast in the middle. Okay, friends, I believe this sums up the sections, and now we're going to head into our last section, which is the claim that Ellen White's tombstone has an obelisk, which obviously is a Masonic symbol, therefore Ellen White is a Freemason. Now, I searched this out and came across some really interesting information about the obelisk during the 1840s. Um, you can have a look for yourself. It's from the website Gravestone Studies. I'm going to read the quotation which highlights the, the, the timing and also the experience when it came towards these gravestones during the 1800s. Notice what it says. The obelisk is, to quote McDowell and Mayer, in the revival styles in American memorial art, one of the most pervasive of all revival forms of cemetery art. There is hardly a cemetery found in the 1840s and 50s without some form of Egyptian influence in the public buildings, gates, tomb art, etc. Napoleon's 1798-1799 to Egyptian campaigns, the discoveries at the tombs of the pharaohs and our new republics need to borrow the best of the ancient cultures, Greek revival, classic revival, the prominence of classic studies and dress, etc. led to the resurgence of interest in the ancient Egyptian culture. Now notice what these these symbols were to be considered as. Obelisks were considered to be tasteful with pure uplifting lines, associated with ancient greatness, patriotic, able to be used in relatively small spaces, and perhaps most importantly, obelisks were less costly than large and elaborate sculptured monuments. There were many cultural reasons for the revival styles of the 19th century. Freemasonry, while part of the overall cultural influence, was not responsible for the prevalence of obelisks. If you would like to read more about some of these styles, see the Egyptian Revival, its sources, monuments and meanings, 1808 to 1859 by Richard Carrot. So friends, this wasn't seen in their time as a symbol of Freemasons or those associated to secret societies, right? This was from the basis of culture, upliftment and tradition, right? It was not subjected to masons just because some of these symbols are used today. Now a classic example could be based upon this picture right here. Notice this picture. Now these are Seventh-day Adventist pioneers and, and, and what you can notice here is that they've got their hand in their jacket. Now I've noticed some people say that oh this is a Freemason pose. But again, this is actually a pose, if you do the research, a pose of, um, it, was, it, was a, it was like a pose of dignity, a pose of, of firmness, like a, like a pose of manliness, you could say. So, when you see this obelisk on Ellen White's tomb, you have to take into consideration the time in which they lived. And again, I guess as I've always said, you have to consider all the angles before making a direct conclusion. Now have a look at this picture. This is a picture that was used as an example. You see graves with the obelisk all over the place. Now this was also during the 1800s and obviously you can't really conclude that because all of these people had obelisks on their tombstones that they were all Freemasons. We can't conclude that. But what we can conclude is the gravestone association was actually correct. Now the reason why I can also say that is based upon what I also found out. I actually did research on what a Masonic tomb actually looked like, like the Masonic um, monuments, etc. I want you to notice what they look like. Now, we can see clear Freemasonic symbols all over the tombstone showing clear affiliation with these groups. Now, this is what they would you know, typically look like, but you don't see anything like that stated on Ellen White's tombstone. In fact, Ellen White's tombstone, what you can see is the obelisk, but you can also see the Bible verse which says, Behold, I come quickly. This is in Revelation chapter 22. Okay, friends, um, we're going to stop here. This is the, um, you know, we've come to the end now because I believe everything has been clear. Um, all the claims that Brother Nathalie has put forward has been answered and clarified. So to say that Ellen White contradicted the Bible, to say that the clear word is a Seventh-day Adventist Bible, to say that Jesus is not Michael the Archangel after looking into the biblical evidence, to say that William Miller was a Freemason throughout his life, yet he was converted, 
and also to say that Ellen White and James White were Freemasons and to falsify the claim that they made this image with the intent that it was based upon Freemasonry things and Luciferianism, all the accusations are false. Now I'm not going to say much more about it except that I pray that this information has been seen as true and clear. And after going through all of these things, it clarifies my reason why I'm still yet a Seventh-day Adventist. The reason why I am a Seventh-day Adventist is based upon what Tina Simon said. Um, Tina Simon is the one who watched Series 1 and became baptized and her testimony is on the page, or is on the YouTube page. The reason why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist is as she said, it is because the doctrines are biblical. So friends, as we come to a close, I just want to say please be open-minded when it comes to seeking and searching for what is true. Christ says, if you seek me, you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. So it's not a half-hearted thing. We can't come with a copy and paste from websites mentality without carefully seeking and searching all the angles of what is true. Um, obviously, Naphtali didn't do this, as we see, and it's quite sad because... Many people who have probably watched or listened to his videos may be content with the information and thus led to think that everything that he said was true because they don't search out things for themselves. So my message is to please search everything out for yourself. Even the information I've posted here, please search it out for yourself. I, I am willing to send all the information that I use in the videos upon request so you can have a clear mind on what the information has been published. But as for Ellen White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, based upon the waymarks of prophecy and the signs of the times displayed even in this year, 2016, already, it's already clear to me that the Lord raised up the Seventh-day Adventist movement for such a time as this. Uh, if you want to know more about this and if you want to see more evidence as to why I believe this, please go back and watch Series 1 on this channel and you will see everything clarified in the Word of God. Okay friends, um, we end here with a series of the replies to Naphtali. In the next series, we're going to cover how to study the Bible. Uh, at the moment, that's a work in progress, so please keep us in prayer. And we do pray that when it is completed, it will be a huge aid to your own personal Bible studies. As I come to a close now, I'm going to read one last quote regarding Ellen White and the work that the Lord has given her to do. I want you to notice how clear and how real she was when it came to this subject, you could say. Testimonies, Volume 4, page 229, says this. For 30 years, we have been receiving the words of God and speaking them to his people. We have trembled at the responsibility which we have accepted with much prayer and meditation. We have stood as God's ambassadors in Christ's stead, beseeching souls to be reconciled to God. We have warned of danger as God has presented before us the perils of his people. Our work has been given us of God. What then will be the condition of those who refuse to hear the words which God has sent them? Because they cross their tract or reprove their wrongs? If you are thoroughly convinced that God has not spoken by us, why not act in accordance with your faith and have no more to do with a people who are under so great a deception as this people are? If you have been moving according to the dictates of the Spirit of God, you are right and we are wrong. God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil. In arraying yourself against the servants of God, you are doing a work for God or for the devil. And then she says in conclusion, by their fruits ye shall know them. What stamp does your work bear? It will pay to look critically at the results of your course. And so friends, as she says, if you're going to conclude that the Seventh-day Adventist movement and the inspiration given to Ellen White is of God or not, at least take heed to the counsel that Paul gives in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. Prove all things 
hold fast that which is good. Thank you very much for watching this series. I pray that it's been clear and may God bless each and every one of us into the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.